Okay, so we're going to uh, to take a closer look at the um, the thread forms. Uh, way back in the very beginning, we did 09 the sleeve, and we put we went from a, a half 12, which was a standard thread form, has since been updated to half 13, and we put that in as a whole wizard item, and we got a cosmetic thread. Um, we got over to the cradle, I believe. And it had that one and three quarter, whatever the uh, the thread form was. We'll have to have to refer back to it. It had the the big thread on it, and um, and actually the uh, the two lock nuts both had those uh, those thread forms on it. And even though we were at least reasonably able to add them to the whole wizard, I wasn't able to find them in the um, uh, the thread tool. So I want to use this one as the uh, the example. And with the, uh, the whole thread, the simplified thread form, I'm just going to hide that cosmetic thread. And we'll see it in uh, when we're normal to, right, so, or perpendicular. Right, so if I'm looking at it, now let me turn it back on before I get away from the explanation. That little dashed line is my looking normal to. And then looking at it from the side, I'm going to see the simplified thread form where the whole location is. If I want to do anything different, then I'm just going to hide the whole um, the, the whole um, the whole wizard item, and we can come up under the features and expand out under the whole wizard and go to thread. Um, I wasn't real fond of thread when it first came out. It's gotten better. There were some offset issues and some other things that made it kind of weird. Had truncated threads that you really didn't want, and um, We'll go into that one. I'll just mention quickly the advanced hole uh, will allow you to put um, a counter bore on this side and then go through it one um, one diameter and then a countersink on the other side. So basically, instead of creating two whole wizard items from opposite sides of the part, the advanced hole will allow you to create that one one piece of geometry. So we'll I'll try to find an example of the advanced, and then it comes up with the warning for the thread. And uh, nominal thread profiles only. Do not use them for production quality threads. Uh, modify your nominal or modify the nominal to meet your design requirements. So they're giving you basic um, basic information. All right, we can go back and verify that. So the edge of the cylinder gives a um, a starting point. It's asking for a start location. Don't really need one. It's on that um, on that edge. I can always offset it if it does not give me a complete thread to start. And my other option would have been the other other um, other hole or other edge of the hole. Um, start angle at zero degrees is fine. End condition is up to selection most of the time. All right, so if I get it that far, let's see what it uh, what it does. And uh oh. That's what it did on my one and three quarters. So I have a mismatch in the uh, the database. So I wonder if that was from the update. Going from 2016 to 2017, we may have lost. Uh, I'll have, now I'll definitely have to find the database. All right. So what I'm expecting to see in here is the type. It's an ANSI inch and a size of half 13. And we have the uh, since we selected the minor diameter, I would expect to see the major diameter and then threads, uh, pitch size. Are we going to cut or extrude? Um, basic information, it's right-handed. Um, multiple starts through, through, or two through, what, five? Two through four, if you want multi-starts. Um, multi All right, so I have to go back and do that one then. So plan B says that I want a thread form in there. Maybe I'm going to 3D print this. And even though I don't like 3D printing threads, I can adjust the tolerances, open it up, and as long as I can have a fairly wide open tolerance, uh, you know, sloppy tolerance on the thread to prove the, uh, the function of the part, I can get enough of a thread in there and then chase it with a, with a tap and get a decent mechanical fit. Perfect. By no means is it going to be perfect, but it's going to be close. All right, so for a swept cut, and um, I'm kind of bummed that the uh, thread did it, did that. Um, 
for a swept cut, which would have been the, uh, the next go around, we're going to open up a sketch. And I'm just going to convert my edge into the sketch. Convert entities, done. That's the profile. Next, I need a helix. And so that's going to fall under the curve, which is a helix and spiral, or go up to insert and find the uh, the curve and basically the same thing, helix and spiral, spiral, or come over to search commands, type in helix. Uh, we are defined by pitch and revolution, height and revolution, height and pitch, and the spiral makes it look like a record player, if anybody remembers records. Final? Any takers? No? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so pitch and revolution, how far between each thread and how many revolutions. We'll probably end up using those for the uh, the spring, either the height and revolution, um, and then uh, we have the um, the height and pitch. So let's go with a um, a height of, and I can always overrun it a little bit more. If we reverse the direction, it goes into the part, and it was only ever two inches to begin with. Pitch is 1 divided by 13. All right, And just like their warning said is, these are just really very generic numbers to start with. If you open up the machinery's handbook, you open up any of the engineering handbooks and get down to the class of fit and what you need for pitch, uh, actual pitch and, um, and numbers, uh, these are going to be off by a little bit or a lot, depending. Uh, start angle at 180 degrees, stay on a quadrant, 0, 90, 180, 270. So I'm okay with the 180, and it is going to be clockwise. If we were going to make this a taper or a pipe tap, then we would put the one, I think it's one and a half degrees included into the, uh, to the mix, and um, that would generate our taper. All right, so once I have the helix, that's my path. That's what we're going to start with. So I do need to identify where 180 actually fell at. Looks like it's coming over to an endpoint. And that is going to go through the top plane. Okay, so when I sketch that, kind of looking again. All right, so it's going to be on the lower edge. Yeah, top plane, control 5 to get to the top view. And mainly I just want to make sure that my uh, 60 degree sharp V triangle is going to have the, uh, the desired result. All right, I'll go ahead and add that one. Go to 4 construction. So 60 degrees. And I think I got something extra in there, so I'll make sure that I catch that. All right, we'll try again, 60. All right, and if I go to 1 divided by 13 again, that's going to give me the, uh, the 076 number, hopefully. But the problem here is that this point will either connect or overlap, or it will see it as a zero thickness intersection. So I have a choice. I can either increase the pitch, or I can decrease the thread form. And in all reality, if we go to the roots in the crest and actually draw this with the correct geometry, a nice little root radius, a nice little crest, then this becomes less of an issue. And since I'm making this completely sharp for convenience, uh, I'm going to end up taking this, let's just back it down. I don't know that I want to go too far, but let's see if it works okay losing, uh, what, is, what was that, uh, 23 millionths? <laughs> Something along those lines, very small amount. All right, and then some portion has to be pierced through the curve. Coincident will not cut it. All right, so when I select the curve and I say pierce, you get coincident, but think about in this plane, coincident is every point along, up and down along that curve. Pierce says I have two possible solutions, and okay, I have a lot more than that because 
we jumped to, to that one. And I want to say 2014 or 2015 is when they let the sweep go both ways. But yeah, I'm not really, I'm not really uh, up for that. I would rather just have it pierced to the location that I want. All right, so the issue would be that if I went too high, if I went to this point, it would start without a complete revolution and I would have a truncated thread or I would show a truncated thread. Starting at the middle is kind of the best. If this um, stops short, I'm going to be able to see where the final thread intersection, you know, coming up to a shoulder, coming up to my geometry, is going to land. And then if I were to put it completely outside, the issue is on the other end is if it does stop short, then is it coming up to a shoulder? Is it something that I do need to, to stop in relation to some other piece of geometry? All right, so those give me some options, and most of the time I'm going to want something hanging off one end. So that being the case, the midpoint is good for a start. Maybe I would go back and change it depending on what the final condition is going to be. With a swept cut, we have two sketches. And so the helix, helix spiral and the sketch 10 become the basis for my swept cut. And pre-selecting them, the profile is sketch 10, the triangle, and the path is the helix. And then it's following the path, minimum twist. There are a bunch of parameters that come with, with swept. All right, so sketch profile, circular profile. I haven't done a circular profile that I know of. The solid profile would be that we draw the tool as a solid body, and we have the tool create the geometry. So that's always a little interesting. The helix spiral then does not get consumed anymore at um, some point. Um, the, uh, the cut swept is re referencing back to it, but it is not being put into that geometry or being consumed by the geometry. So let's take the section and then there is the cut. All right, so this is what everybody did in board drafting back in high school, right? No. Um, you know, it's basically to the to the sharps, connect the dots, made your sharp V. But again, this does not take into account that there is a crest, that there is a root, and the the initial uh, geometry just gets me started. It's not like the final final world. So again, if I saw this come around and it left a, a little overhang there, I didn't get that triangle far enough off the geometry to make it. All right, so we'll turn off the section view. A section view is only active while we're doing something with it. Now, the other um, thing that we might run into is that when I go to perform a mate, if I don't pick out here, that these don't remain concentric, or if they're off, I have a little bit of an issue picking up that thread because I did not create a crest. Now, I could go back through and figure out what the crest I am, you know, what the offsets are, and then put a cut extrude, but I might as well go ahead and um, and build the geometry correct in the first place as uh, the profile and the, you know, the cut swept. So that gives you a, a start on, on the sweeps. So we're going to see what that does uh, a little later on in the, uh, the mix. Let's go ahead and pull up the, okay. the spring. And for the spring, we have a couple of conditions. I always get asked, can I make the spring move like animation? And it's like, no, nah, not really. All right, that's a lot of computing power, a lot of horsepower to make, uh, make all those different um, locations. What we can do is set some configurations. And since we have three springs, the uh, item 30 spring, I think I'm going to make a note of that real quick so I can halfway track which ones are which. Um, come over to item 18 and item 17. All right, so all of those are going to be included in this one file. Now, uh, whenever I do the um, the assembly or the, uh, the start of the configurations, I always say that um, um, we can bring this first spring and... Um, and do a save as and create the next one and the next one. But you think about how many hundreds or thousands of springs may fit into this category. Do 
do I really want hundreds or thousands of files? If I could find common geometry and say these are all going to be 093, 062, or you know whatever my, my parameters are, and just change lengths or change uh, the geometry, I could have one part file that in the assembly is very easy to say, oh, I picked the wrong one, I'm going to go back and grab a different one, as opposed to replacing the complete spring. So item 30 was uh, an 062, so those are kind of my base, uh, base starts. So we have to pick one. And as far as orientation, it doesn't really matter. So front plane, we need a base circle. And this is given as uh, 7 16 I want to say that that's probably the, um, the outside diameter. So for the oh, how about we go to the correct number? And so connecting the uh, the circle, this being an OD, the circle is going to be connected at the interior, and it will grow or shrink to the uh, to the inside. All right. So we go ahead and accept it. Go back into our helix spiral. And this is given as the free state of 3 inches on the height. And no, I don't have a pitch. I have um, definition of S-Steel stock 062 diameter, 24 coils, and the ends are closed. Okay, so that gives me, instead of height and pitch, height and revolutions. So we go 3 inches, 24 revolutions, and call good. So, does it actually end? You know, does this point actually end somewhere usable? Or is it this point? Where did I sketch from? <laughs> okay, I sketched from this one. So, let me double check since I jumped over it. We're still starting at 180, so that's good to know. And the chances of this one being at 180. Let's see, let's go to the top plane. Evaluate, measure, and the items intersect. Well, I can almost uh, guarantee that when we shrink this from 3 inches to whatever function, then it's constrained state, that that probably isn't going to be the case. That this is going to, as it wraps around or varies, um, adjust some, somewhere in its angular dimension. All right, so that being the case, I want to make sure that I'm on the sketched in. We'll open on the top plane. I said that my circle, and since they gave us three inches overall, it gets a little strange, but I'm not opposed to putting some center lines on this and tying them together as long as something is connected to 062, as long as something is connected to the curve. So horizontal and tangent. Let's see what's oh, and there's that coincident example. I did coincident automatically, and now it can move pretty much wherever it wants to along at least that one segment of the curve. All right. So by contrast, Pierce says that there are two possible solutions. I started to say this earlier, so let me uh, finish that thought. Where this plane goes through the curves, you have a solution here. And you have a solution here. And then, obviously, going up the curve, there's more solutions. But in, in respect, you have one on this side and one on this side. And then take your pick of which loop you want. All right, so that being the case, that gives me a completed sketch. And if that works correctly, actually, it's going to make this end just a little bit long. So... This may be where if I wanted this to be exactly three inches. Now, are you going to get a spring in its free state that you can measure and get to exactly three inches? Probably not. It'd be cool, but uh, I'm not holding my breath on that one. But if I needed it to show exactly at three inches, then I would probably write an equation that says go find this, subtract the diameter that we just created, and go through that process. Features, swept boss base, ties together, we see the preview, I get the desired result. 
All right, and then what I'm referencing is the curve ends here at three inches, and my last loop is just above that. All right, so this is actually three inch 062. Whatever. <laughs> All right, so to close the ends, I am not going to trust this to, uh, to again, always be at the same angle. So we're going to open up a sketch, convert the entities. I need a, a vertical center line. We'll just go ahead and make it infinite length. And how concerned am I that this is going to intersect? Not really. It's closed end. It ties back in and it's there. If this was a ground in, then I would come back and flatten it. Put a cut extrude and chop off part of the material so I have the ground ends. All right, but the functionality of the geometry is just, I have something that represents a spring. All right, in the, um, in the early version of the drawing, they showed cylinders and pointed at it and said, this is a spring. What more do you need to know other than this is the description and it takes up space. This is the description and it takes up space, but this is a little fancier. So same thing, open up the sketch, convert the entities, center line, infinite length, vertical, and we'll tie those together. Go ahead and revolve, let it go 360. And if I really wanted to, I could kind of calculate, well, it's gonna come over here to 270 and then it's gonna It'll, uh, it'll suffice. And then we can hide it. So this is um, the, well, we're just going to call it springs. So as far as uh, what I'm going to upload to Canvas for you guys is um, I'm going to give you these. I'm not expecting you to create these. We are going to insert these into the assembly, hopefully tonight if I can get everything working correctly. And so that is the, the first spring. All right. And we're, again, we're not really concerned about the, the free state because this is going in the assembly somewhere and for a compression spring to not be compressed and actually have some spring force in action, three inches doesn't do me a whole lot of, uh, a lot of good generally. All right. But we can, uh, we can talk about it in this free straight, free state and then come back and pick up the other uh, geometry. All right, so we're at the point where I could do a save as, and I could change the numbers, and we could go back through, but I want to set this up as a configuration. All right, and this is three items. This is a good jumping off for the configuration. Um, when we did 5-2 uh, out of the, uh, the assignments, and I did all of the plates from the 1-by-1 one one to the 4-by-4 four four as configure, you know, a single configure, or a single part file with, you know, however many configurations, that's kind of the higher end. So let's, you know, this, including the springs, that's a little bit of a, or the, the helix, that's a little bit of a challenge, but I think we're, uh, we're okay with it. So things that we need to know, the outside diameter, OD. All right. So instead of, um, D1 at sketch one, that's now the uh, OD at sketch one and 437. When we go to the uh, to the helix, then this becomes length. All right, so length at helix spiral. Um, the instances, all right, so where it starts, we can kind of grab all of these things. There's my instance count, or, uh, or loops, or what do they call it, coils? So let's go with coils. If I can type, there we go. All right, so that gives me some good information, or at least some starter information. And then, um, what was it? In sketch two, we have the diameter. All right, so by naming those or giving them a little bit more descriptive naming, when I go into the equations, and let's, uh, let's see, it's gonna be tools, and down to equations, and we come back over to the dimension view. Everything that is important to me, or I think is important to me at this point, is showing up with a name. Okay. 
So I want to drive this. And if the um, default, I've always kind of said keep a default, but you don't necessarily have to. I can rename the default, and this was item, let me just look at it, item 30, item 17, item 30. So I can rename the default. I just have to be a little careful because now I don't have anything falling back on. So this is either going to prove or disprove my theory on uh, on retaining the default. Always having that safety net to go back to and saying, if I totally screw up everything else, I can get back to the default and start it again. All right, so we want to configure some features. And so let's go ahead with the... Um, Properties cannot be loaded, really, and it's tied back to 2016. Uh, located at install directly. All right, I'm okay with that. We still have some upgrading issues, uh, apparently. All right, so item 17. And so whatever part numbers we'd want to use. And item 18 gives us um, that information. All right, so for the helix and spiral, there is the OD. I double click on it, it adds a column. I double click on it, that adds, um, adds the length. And then that instance count, the number of coils. All right, and then, let's see, did I do the diameter? No, all right, so. Oils Pro. Now I did all that. I forgot the last one. <laughs> what is the last one? Three inches. Um, no, we got the length, the coils. Okay, that's four. All right, so we'll pick it up in a minute. It'll it'll magically appear. I'm pretty sure. All right, so item 17, the um, the OD goes to point uh, five nine three. And the diameter is 0 0.093. All right, so 330 seconds. And then the number of coils. Oh, that was the, no, that's the length. Um, 1.812. 1 in 1316. And the number of coils for that one. Ends closed and, oh, that one's closed and ground. Lovely. All right, so that one didn't give me a count. So my logic, uh, no, there's eight coils on that one for 18. But that one's only in 1.125. One All right, so I'm going to pick a number since it's a little less than half. 10. And the item 18 was um, 1.125, number of coils is 8, and that diameter OD is 468, and 093 was okay. So other than this number, I'm feeling pretty confident that I got most of it. I may be miss missing one or two things, but let's go ahead and apply and OK, and rebuild. All right, so it adds item 17, and it updates. Now, because these are called out as ground, I don't have a condition for the, um, the ground ends. And wow, I think maybe <laughs> the 8 even looks a little bit uh, tight for that one. Ends closed and ground, all right. So that's one more one more item that we need to take care of, and so at the uh, the three inch mark, let's see that one's going to be because we went up and in. That one's going to have to be to the diameter. So show, and we're.
we're going to go into the same plane, top plane. All right, so the development of the configurations does not happen like immediately. So we're going to go coincident. Uh, let's select midpoint, control select the origin. That can be vertical. I would like this to be a little bit bigger. I don't really have the uh, the endpoint. Maybe we go to the. If I show the, no, nope, that's going to break it a little bit too low. So I'd like some piece of geometry. If I hit all the buttons here. All right. So if it'll let me have that point, and that point will stay consistent, I'll use it. And then, let's see, also that point. All right, as long as my box is bigger than the, uh, the spring, that's all I really need. And I just need a point to locate it. All right, so now, um, ends closed and ground, ends closed and ground. The first one, in, oh, it was in closed and ground too. I missed that. All right, well, that makes it easier. Extrude cut. Everything that's highlighted on the interior is going to go away. When we flip the side, the side to cut, then it reverses. And would help if I gave it a little more information other than a blinding condition. And we go through all both instead. Okay, that's going to give me the desired result. All right, so go back and hide. All right, so the check, the check then is that did we end up close to 1.125 because the ends were ground? Yeah, are we a little bit off of the origin? Yeah, I probably didn't need that little offset thing, but I'm okay with that. It's not, I don't foresee having to do a lot of um, uh, the mates to the, uh, to the front plane. All right, so the check then is going to item 17. It comes back because I did not include it as a suppression state. All right, so 30 doesn't have it either. Because we added it to item 18 and not to the others, then we either have to go one by one, and I want to suppress or unsuppress by default. Uh, could not be found, okay. And then item 17. And let's see if we can uh, configure the feature. And still can't find the properties. That's nice. And so by configuring the feature for cut extrude one, in 17 is the only remaining item that's un, uh, is suppressed. I can uncheck it. Now they will all be available together. So I can either go configuration by configuration or configure the feature and get that item in place. All right, so now it participates. Have I made that complex enough? <laughs> Configurations start off simple and they and you build into them and you find your geometry and you let it evolve. And you make the mistakes and you correct them and you go to the, to the next level. All right, so that gives me a spring. What I don't have then these were all free states. I would have to go back into the assembly and measure for what the compressed state is going to be, what is actually the, the usable. So right now, these are all, um, I should have denoted that. Um, the other thing is that when this goes into the build material, it's just going to be listed as springs. So when we get to that point in our drawing, that's an issue because I have spring, 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 and I don't know what they are. All right, so this is where we're going to go into the properties. And under the properties, we want to, instead of the part number displayed when used in build materials, instead of springs, document name, we're going to switch to configuration name. When I go to configuration name, the springs disappears. It's going to use that, that name. If I gave this a custom name, all right, so we go to use, user specified, Whatever I put in there would show up in brackets at the end of the configuration. 
But most of the time, if I just go ahead and create the configuration name, which is going to be more descriptive than just about anything else, I'm going to use it in the bill of materials. Oh, I hope to do the last one then. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, now we have to find out where one of these is being used. <laughs> All right, so I know there's one in here, and I don't have the, um, the exact description. So let's talk about some of the, uh, the view properties. We'll review these again. Uh, let's see, did we um, create a display state? No, this would be a good time to create a display state because I'm about to totally mess this thing up. So right click, display state, add, and display state 2 comes up and I'm going to rename that to my work in progress. So that means I can, I can go crazy with this and jump back and forth and it's not going to affect the original display state. So hitting tap. Hovering over a part, hitting tab in your assembly, height. So I can get those out of the way relatively quickly. And that one was pretty deep. Oh, I didn't know that went all the way through. Does that go all the way through? <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Well, I'm pretty sure there's a spring in there, but that seems kind of strange. All right, so from... And that's not going to be perpendicular, so... Normal distance, two and a half, so that kind of makes sense that it would... Why would they... Okay, there's another one of those questions that remains unanswered. Existing part and assembly. We're going to bring in the spring. And notice that it comes in as uh, which configuration do you want? And so I think item 30 was the first one that we did. I maybe item 17. Come back to it. Yeah, item 30 was the long one. And since I did not add any uh, reference mates, it's just going to come in. Okay. So, if that is an actual circle, then I might be able to make that concentric. Springs are kind of one of those special cases. Are you going to let me have it? No? Ah, it did. All right, so it's letting me edge to cylinder as concentric. And then should not be too picky when it comes in. Holding down the shift and tab brings back the other part, and we're assuming, I may have to bring up the, um, the early, that that's going to be coincident, and why can't that be, and, and over define these uh, simply, or cancel. All right, so chances are, if that's able to rotate, then it's not going to stay parallel. So that 0 0.64 degrees, that's enough that it cannot align to the, to the whole center and stay in position. So are we going to try and make that perfect? Well, I'm trying to move it, but this is a sub-assembly item. So question is, do I want all of my hardware at the top level assembly in each individual sub-assembly, etc.? So let's go into the cradle. And now we can see as this is moving up and down, that was our intent was to have this dynamic. Well, as soon as I lock in that spring, or the spring could potentially create a circular argument, um, it's going to uh, to choke on it. So 
let's go with a, at least initially, we're going to add a parallel, which should not put anything into conflict. It's just going to help me with my assembly, but it no longer moves. So I may have to have a configuration that is dynamic. So if I add this configuration and say I need a dynamic, so that the handle moves, we go back and we find that last mate, which is going to be at the very bottom of the list. I suppress it. So configurations, again, are for suppression. Uh, do they exist, not exist? What is the dimension? What is the instance count? What are the, the things that we're trying to control? Or the display states, or what does it look like? What color is it? What kind of texture does it have on it? Is it visible? Is it transparent? Those are where those come in. So the double check here is to go into the default. And um, for the default, parallel is in effect, does not move. For dynamic, I can move again. All right, so since I left that in place, and we'll go ahead and close, the default comes up. Move that down the 0.64 degrees. If I select normal distance, 3 16 of an inch, that means they're parallel. I can measure, and that can go to coincident. All right, so how far does it um, does it spring? That still seems a little weird to me, but okay, I'm I'm not a, a hundred percent. Time for the early. <laughs> I'm going to obsess over this no matter what, so I might as well get it over with. All right, where did the folder go? Our parts. So that one's shown as a blind hole. The other one picked up as through. That makes more. It certainly makes more sense. So, and there's also the little plunger thing in there that we need to bring in from. That's what you did for you. Yep. All right, so we'll bring that in. And so I need um, I need to mention, I, I sent that through for whatever reason. And and then in the process, I mentioned this before, is that I know that I'm going to make mistakes. I know that there's going to be things that I overlook. I'm counting on the assembly process to go through and highlight those. I'm counting on the drawing process to go through and highlight those and catch them before they get to you know, either design reviews or, you know, too far out to where I'm then counting on somebody else to look at it and go, why did you do that? All right, so that was two inches deep. That makes a little more sense. And so hopefully the geometry uh, plays out there. So I can open it, edit it. And there's the cutting screwed for. And so maybe it was an assumption. But the main thing is I did not tie these together. All right, so when I go back to this one, looking at the this is through, this is not through, if they were tied together in the same feature, I got a little bit of a problem. I would probably have to go back and do that uh, contours and regions, share the sketch, do a different, uh, do a different feature with a shared sketch. I have options. Two inches. All right, so that being the case, let's go ahead and save it. And yes, and we can see how far it uh, is sticking out. So let's go with the, uh, the section view. We'll do a little problem solving here. Uh, did it go through everything or no? Oh, it did not go far enough. All right, so that looks pretty good. All right, so from there to there, two inches. And now I'm wondering if that's the correct spring, but let's go with this one. We had a three inch. 
the 1.812 free, free state doesn't really, and the 1.125 in a 2 inch hole, that's not, it's not touching anything, so that leaves the 3 inch. So from there to there is 2 and 3 sixteenths. That would be my compressed, compressed distance at parallel. All right, so when it's locked into over on the cam and the cam pushes down, uh, the cam may push down further and go in a little bit of an angle, but that gives me a number to work with. All right, so we said that was item 30. Let's, um, let's see, is that going to be the helix or the, yeah, I think that's going to be the helix. So if I configure that feature, yes, I know, I'm still looking for the, the piece. And then I'm going to have an item 30. So I'll just abbreviate it compressed. Still has 24 loops, 2.187. And at what point does it go to full compression? Can't go any further because all of the, uh, the items are locked up. And I'm trying to forget that, uh, I'm trying to forget that plunger piece. So it's going to be even smaller, about two inches. Well, that may put it into the to the point that um, one of the other ones will fit. All right, but let's go ahead and work through this um, as a, an option and see if it errors. Compressed, doable, but is it correct? All right, so we still have some things to verify and play out on uh, on these items. All right, so. Right-clicking, we can come up to the very top. And that shows it pretty much has the clearance, but again, it's not taking into account the, uh, the plunger or whatever our item was. All right, so that assumes contact. And then how much, how much more can we put in there? All right, so decision time. Let's go ahead and bring in the cradle. And again, these are going to be our parts. I'm going to come back to the files. And may not be the, um, or when I was planning on introducing the, uh, the translated files, but we need it. It's here. I picked this as uh, where the plunger was going to, uh, to be located. So we're going to bring it in. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Ooh, serious problem. <laughs> All right, so let's make sure it opens. <laughs> now, this may be a 2017, 2018, just because it did it before. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be that one. It thinks it's a solid cam file because we have... All right, so the drag and drop did not like, but... We're going to tell it that it is a part inch. Um, it is going to translate it, but it does show up as the plunger PRT. So if you were to go back into Creo and adjust this model and update this file, SolidWorks would see it. That's the desired result. I don't need to have Creo. I don't need to have NX. I don't need to have Inventor. I need to have the update occur associatively so that if there is a change, I don't have to go replace this. I don't have to go uh, back through the entire process. All right, so import diagnostics if you want to run them. No faulty faces or gaps, so that's a clean translation. And then we save it. And remember the number on that one? I'm going to stay consistent. I'm trying to stay consistent with the... Uh, I know you're here somewhere. Come out, come out. Where? <laughs> okay, so that was item 19. No, it is an external reference. It comes in with the solid body, and the solid body is the part file. It, um, I think it's 19. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what 29 is. <laughs> it's, 
Uh oh, there was. You're correct. There was another one. Oops. <laughs> I just saw the plunger and and jumped. As usual. Alright, now I'm not sure. I saw it on there. There it is. You're, you are correct. It's 29. So this will be interesting because we get to rename. <laughs> Alright, so the link, we need to have that original file. I can't just go back and delete blunderpart.prt. It has to remain intact. It, it's you know, saved in my translated files or the other uh, file folder. And then um, it generates geometry. It's using its reference planes, which look pretty much the same as. Everything's everything's good. So um, I really need to rename that before I put it into the assembly. So the undesirable way, we'll do it first. If you come into Windows Explorer and this file is already in use, you can expect SolidWorks to say, I can't find it. So not the most desirable. Because it has not been assigned, I can get away with it. But I'm throwing out the warning that as soon as you use this, as soon as you relate it, as soon as it has a reference to it, it's a problem. All right? So if I do something like that, right now it's not going to bark because the file's closed. It still has the reference. If I double click on it, keep my fingers crossed, it still points to the plunger. And we, we have the correct geometry. The preferred method, if it's installed, I need to double check here. And what I'm looking for is SolidWorks, um, uh, SolidWorks Explorer, which at one time I installed separately. And I know it's not on the other window, so let's see if it'll show up over here. Um, not under tools. There's the other side of PDM. All right, I'm not seeing it, so it's either not here. All right, so we're going to have to install it separately. Um, SolidWorks Explorer has some basic renaming capabilities that will also update references. So we'll have to do that next time. Uh, but that gives it a um, at least a reasonable start. All right, so we're going to browse. We're going to go back to item 29, the plunger. And bring that in. It does. It, it is. But again, it's it's using those external references. It's going back to the kernel and saying you have a solid body. When that solid body updates, whether you know you you change the file and you give me a new file and I overwrite it, and it sees the the change, or we edit it directly out of out of Creo or NX or Inventor or whichever, and save it back to that location. SOLIDWORKS is going to see it. All right, so concentric. And the fun part of um, assembling is that two objects can occupy the same space as long as you let them. So I'm going to find that one. Ah, still not really good at that one, so let's move the component. And when I move the component, it doesn't matter how embedded in the part it is. We're going to be able to at least get it to where it's uh, visible. Let's see if the dome will go tangent. How about that? All right, we switch back over to dynamic. The part is present. If the part was not, we would be in showing it as a suppression. And then the check is that as we move up and down, uh, the tangent did not come, come across. All right, so parallel, concentric, tangent. Those are the last in the group. I could also go to item 29 and just look at those two. And even though the part is unsuppressed, it's present. Its mates are not. So that's a quick check is it didn't move the way I expected it to. You know, red flag, go find out why. So unsuppress. And now when we move, plunger is moving with it. All right, so as far up as it can go, in contact with something else back there, uh, whatever the um, that other handle is, we can only go so far before it's going to run into something, right? So let's go back into the section view 
right plane. And probably from there to there. And since I didn't get a, um, a number down here, let's go to measure. And we're still at that 2 and thir uh, 3 sixteenths. So I'm calling that a good number. In which case, that's at its absolute max. Uh, what do we want to do for the default? All right, so if I go to the default, and you know that's that's kind of one of the decisions we have to make is where is this spring geometry going to be of the greatest benefit? What kind of information am I looking for it? Is it going to go to full compression and and lock up? I can't compress it anymore, or um, you know at its at its full full height. And so at 1.812, it's the right height for the other one, but it's not going to expand any. So the question is, can that spring go to 1.812? So feeling, uh, feeling lucky or brave, I'm not sure which. All right, so just because it shows it, I got to check for those gaps. It will go to compression. All right, based on that information, and there's still a little bit more to be had. All right, but that's bringing it down parallel, assuming that the um, that end of the uh, the crank or the uh, the, uh, the connecting rod is you know whatever we're putting in that cone is not going to go too much past parallel. That when the cam comes across, and let's go ahead and bring the cam back. Shift tab. Shift tab, I know you're there somewhere. All right, maybe not. <laughs> Let's go ahead and just show it. And that when the cam comes back across past parallel, um, there is a little bit more downward travel, but not much before the spring bottoms out. All right, so the mechanical fit, we still have the, the bushings. I drew up the, the bushings last night. I was going to see how much time I had. Um, to do the bushings, but they were pretty much the, um, you know, kind of the same, same thing. They're in configurations. Um, we're going to complete the assemblies, but I wanted to introduce, um, introduce those. Let's finish up with the, the lofted base just to make it complicated, right? Something strange or different, uh, to set this thing on. And I don't know that, uh, we have anything perfect here, but, um, all right, so the planes, let's go into the top plane. And with a, where with the swept, we need, or with the sweeps and the swept cut, we need to have two sketches. Well, loft is a minimum of two sketches. You're going to build up cross sections as needed. And the more complex the geometry, the more compl uh, more um, cross sections you're going to end up with. So let's go with a three inch base. And um, it's parallel, or distance, uh, offset distance. And so the top plane, let's try for an ellipse. Just because it'll be fun. And with the ellipse, uh, we end up with four nodes. To keep this from, from rotating, we're going to go back to the origin and set it horizontal. All right, so... It'll stretch and shrink. Major, minor diameters are whichever way we drag it. Okay, that did not quite work the way I wanted it to. If we make one side longer or place a dimension on it, that determines major and minor axes of the um, uh, of the ellipse. All right, so if I go 7 inches and 30 inches, just guessing, there's a nice ellipse. All right, so for the 3-inch base, I need pretty much the, the same type of connection points. Or I would like to have the same number of connection points. So watch what happens when we do the center rectangle. We're going to make that a little bigger. So let's go 35 and 10 is fine. So I have four, four corners. I have four node points. My assumption is that this node point is going to attach to that node point or some, some reasonable facsimile unless I put in a guide curve. 
All right, so we're going to hide the plane. Sketch one, sketch two, and loft. All right, so actually it didn't do too bad, but it did do the uh, the drag right back to the corner. So that tells me that this side is a little, probably a little more deformed. That uh, doesn't look too bad, actually. I'm pleasantly surprised. <laughs> All right, but I'm also trusting that this didn't move a little bit or a lot or to some point where it can't solve. All right, so if I need this loft to have better geometry, I'm going to include a guide curve. And the guide curve doesn't have to be anything special. It can be a line that just goes from point A to point B. And does that stay fully defined? No. All right, so coincident, and actually if we grab the endpoint, which is what I intended it to do, and go coincident. All right, so now I have a, a discrete connection point. It is something that I can force into the loft. All right, and then the guide curve becomes the selection. All right, so this is still able to change it locally, so we might need more but I have a start. Yeah, see how that one got a little bit wider? And that one looks pretty darn close. So I'm not sure why, now I gotta go back and look again why it left, left the handles. Next guide. So do I need, I don't remember needing four, four guide curves to fully define this, but so that's what I get for messing with it. <laughs> Are you really not going to let me? Oh, I'm, I'm in the uh, in the loft. No, that was where it was supposed to be. It doesn't want to travel along that edge. All right. So now I don't remember what that one was called. Close the loft, merge the tangent faces, show preview, next sharp, next edge, oval. All right, so that's going to mess with it a little bit. I thought I could get rid of this, so I'm going to have to look back into that. I don't know if that's something that I haven't done lofts in a while and that came up new, but now I have this interesting shape. And if we want to see how much curvature that has, we can come in and let's just look at, so quite a bit of deformation as we're coming along in that loop. All right, so I will go back and, uh, and try and figure out what I did. And just to make it complicated, we bring in the base, get it close. And because the uh, the top is planar, that was interesting. Did I really pick that? Okay. Oh, that was the inside. All right. Yeah, it's still not going to let me do that one. <laughs> it didn't let me pick it earlier. All right, so coincident, and came pretty close. So my my weird base just got weirder, and I will have to find out what the uh, the definition of that uh, guide curve is. Usually, what I remember is that that disappears and is not an issue. So I'm not sure why it's staying. So next time we will. Uh, Try and figure that out and go through and do some more assembly, get closer to the uh, back into the drawings.